had his own school students in it, and Harry was one of my finest students there. Uh, and I also started going to vestry for 50 years. I just got off about five years ago. <coughs> uh, I am basically a civil engineer. I'm retired right now. I shouldn't say I am a civil engineer because I am retired. I've worked in the civil engineer all my life. Yes. And I want to welcome all of you to, to, to our church. I know some of you have come quite a long ways, and we really appreciate that. But the graves have been an important part of our church, starting back in the, in the 1700s. Actually, in the 1600s, as far as that's concerned. And I was looking through some of the records there the other night, and I saw where five graves made, uh, made a donation to, to the reconstruction of the church itself. So, with that, I would give you my, but I'm just plain joy. That's a, that's a, and I want to thank Eddie for putting all us together. <laughs> okay. You live for it always. Uh, when we talk about the, the, the church itself, uh, we have lots of dates as to when it was, was formally established as a parish. Uh, I used the date of 1692. Of course, 1692 was the, when the assembly in the, in the state. The General Assembly in the state uh, basically authorized the parishes and also established the Church of England as the, as the official state religion. Uh, but before that, uh, we, we know that there was a log building here and that there were services conducted here. Uh, we have dates of weddings that took place in another parish. But they were the weapons was that the people were from Durham Parish itself. And they, they could never make up their mind whether we were going to call it Durham or whether we were going to call it Nanjimoy. It was always Durham, Slant, Nanjimoy. Uh, but before that, uh, we have some records that indicate that it goes back to the beginning, giving the parish really go that it goes back to. 1680s and to the 1660s actually. And we know that there was a wedding that took place in the Fort of Parish in 1685, and that was William Dent and his wife Elizabeth. <coughs> so, it, but I, I do use 1692 as the official date of the establishment of, of the parish itself. The, the assembly. The General Assembly in 1692 established throughout Maryland 30 some parishes uh, as to be the, the again to take care of the official religion for the state itself. Within Charles County, we, we had four, four parishes, William and Mary, which is now located at Wayside, and we had Port Tobacco Parish, of course, that was located in Port Tobacco. And, um, and then St. John's Parish was what they called it called Piscataway Parish is what was called. But it was actually the church of St. John's. So those were the four parishes for Charles County. Uh, <clears throat> along with the establishment of the parishes, I also decreed that as a part of being a state religion, that the, the parish would have the authority to tax the inhabitants of the parish and, the, uh, and support of the church and also a bit for any alterations to the church itself. Um, and that, that being, <coughs> it was, that was, again, was in 1692. Uh, the next big event that, 
Some of them were good, some of them were bad. I, from what I yell at, most of them were bad. <laughs> uh, but in, in 1711, we had the Reverend McConkey, who, who was assigned to two guards, Port Tobacco and, and Durham. Uh, Reverend McConkey came to us in 1711. He stayed with us until 1742. The, the, there was a, there is a, a post office that is named for him and that, that, that really exists today. And that's, at, that's at, about five miles from here. Um, he also owned a plantation in McConkey that was given to him as a part of the land grant from not from Stone, but as part of the as part of the of the Governor Stone uh, land itself. Um, Reverend McConkey, I as I said before, stayed with us until 1742. During his time, the, the church itself was constructed. The General Assembly again authorized 32,000. They that the, the parish could tax the inhabitants up to 32. To, to construct the church. <clears throat> the church uh, was completed in, uh, in 1736 or 1737, around that time. Um, they had to go back to the General Assembly and get an additional authorization to tax the inhabitants another 4,000 pounds of tobacco. Everything in those days was done as far as pounds of tobacco. That was the only currency we had, if you call it currency, but it was everything was in the name of tobacco. If you were going to make a trade for something, it was going to be, or buy something, it was so many pounds of tobacco. And then that was handled through the voucher system itself. Um, the church then, is, but now, is the same size, I mean, lengthwise, as it was then. In this particular room. This is never and the, and the width of it is still the same. The only changes that had been made it was uh, the, that the walls were raised up in 1792. But getting back to the condition of the, of the parish itself, up until the revolution, we had a, we had a free ride. We, didn't have, any, didn't have any concerns about monies at all. Uh, of course, we, we had the authority to tax the people that didn't have any sort of car to support the church, to support any alterations or any repairs or any, or any additions to the church. And also, the minister's salary and, and, his, and maybe any expense that he had. Um, <clears throat> then, right after the revolution, we lost all of our, well, and at the beginning of the revolution, most of the ministers were, at the beginning of the revolution, we had approximately 42 ministers in the, in the state of Maryland. After the revolution, we only had nine left, and that was all. And our minister, as far as we know, um, he did not stay as the minister uh, of the parish, but he did, he did stay in the state of Rome. Um, and as I said before, we lost all of our, all of our support as far as uh, taking care of the minister and also taking care of the church itself. And it was a, it was a very, it was a, was, was a very real bad time as far as the church was concerned. Because Right after the revolution, again, we tried to get the organization to tax the inhabitants. That, that was turned down in big um, But But uh, in, in 1788, we had, we had a Reverend Harrison who was a native of this parish and was educated in England. He came to us as the minister of the parish. Uh, he was one of the three Harrisons. His brother was um, one of the three Harrisons, a Richard Harrison, and his brother was it was William Harrison, who, who was very close to George Washington and served and worked with George Washington through the Revolution. Uh, and and traveled with George Washington. He was also the he was nominated to be the first chief judge of the Supreme Court, but he, unfortunately he died 
employees who take the office to show. But um, Reverend Harrison, again, was, was a son of, of Richard Harrison and brothers to the two, the two Harrisons that were for famous during the revolution itself. Um, Reverend Harrison was a, was a very, um, uh, I'll, put, I'll put it to you, he, he did, hey, he was a man of many talents. He was a contractor, he was a farmer, and he was also a minister. He was, he was known to be able to, he had came, had come to the, to the parish, and he was, first thing he said was, don't worry about my salary, I will collect my own salary. Or he didn't, he didn't, he, he probably was probably telling us at that time that he didn't have sufficient money that he didn't need to have a salary as far as the church was concerned. But he, but in 1791, the church had, a, had an overall meeting of the congregation and everybody was complaining then about the condition of the church and the repairs that was needed. And they set up a committee to, to make recommendations for the repairs. And on that committee was General Smallwood, who was the chairman of the committee itself. Their recommendation was, number one, we have to repair them, we have to replace the floor, which was not only replaced, but it was also lowered. It was actually 12 inches higher than what it is today. And it was just made it more convenient for the termites. Because when you look at the records of the church, you'll see numerous times when this floor has been replaced. And also to replace the roofing on the church. And they come up with recommendations on the, as to, to the other alterations that was needed as far as the church was concerned. And they made some major uh, recommendations. One was that they were to install balconies on three sides of the church. Send them all the way around on this side and also to come around with it all the way around. Um, <clears throat> then uh, and then then also at that time, not only to extend the balconies, but to uh, to provide an access on the on the outside for the for, to the balconies on that end of the church itself. But let me go back for just a little bit. The original church was laid out in a different, in basically in a right angle way that was to what it is today. The main entrance to the church was right at this, what is now, I wonder, that was the main entrance. The pulpit was right over in, in, in between those two windows over there. And the church bench was under that. And the communion table was where that window is, and that window was bricked in. That's why that's concerned. That's the way it was originally on the original church itself, on the original layout of the church. Uh, and then we had in it the box pews. Uh, there are two of those upstairs, as far as that's concerned. Uh, Box pews scattered throughout, I said scattered, not I, I've sat down many times and tried to figure out how, with the main entrance here, how they could arrange the, the, the box pews. But also, if you look at the minutes of the, of the vestry, you'll see many, many people concerned about the particular box pew that they occupied for their family. And you dare not come to church and find somebody sitting in their pew. Because mm -hmm. the, the vestry would be told immediately about that and then a complaint would be made. There were many complaints made about the seating arrangement and, and who was going to give what. what. Uh, they, uh, now, as far as the 1792 operation, I mentioned the balconies uh, on the three sides of the church. And also, to do this, raising the walls of the church about four feet and taking out the windows that was there, which were uh, apparently from the way it looks from an architectural standpoint. The windows were taller than what they are today, but they took the they low level of the windows down, put the, 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 these windows, these swallow windows down, and then put a level of windows in. 
first stayed this way until we had a minister by the name of a Reverend Crowley who came to us from Baltimore. Reverend Crowley was very unique from the standpoint of very, very unique, unique life. He married two of our local parish girls. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, was the Dyson. And she, she, she passed away, and then the second wife was a Miss, a Miss Kobe, a Miss Betty Kobe. Uh, she, she was, uh, she often talked about his first wife as the, uh, the devotion that he had for her. Uh, his first wife did not die while he was a member, while he was a minister of this parish. And he moved, when he left the parish the first time, by the way, he served here twice, a total of 50 years altogether. But, um, he, went, he went from this parish to a parish in Baltimore, and then from there to a parish in, in Calvary County. If you go into Calvary County, you'll find that the Episcopal Church in Prince Frederick, but he was the minister that was in charge of the construction of that particular church. So he came back to us in the 1840s and stayed here until he died in, in the 1880s. And he did again and spent about 50 some years there. He was another one of the ministers that we had who did not require a salary as far as he was financially well off and he did not need to have a salary as far as the parish was concerned. Uh, and during his time, we had the first assistant minister here, and his name was Taylor, by the way, and he paid for the salary of, of Robin Taylor. <coughs> during that time, the church, had, before the, the Reverend Crump came back the second time, we planned for being made to, to have another major renovation as far as the church was concerned. And, and with his guidance, we were, the church was completely turned around from what it was. The pulpit was moved from, from, the, from the north side from up to the east side, to the east of the way it's supposed to be. Normally, most churches, they all have six in the east, and that's the way, that's the way it was rearranged. Um, and the church has stayed, the configuration of the church has stayed that way ever since then. Um, he also, these pews were bought at the same time. And as far as I can tell, these, these pews date back to 1848. Uh, they, <coughs> and then again, as a part of the renovation at that time, the floor was re re replaced again. And the balconies were taken up oh, on two sides. The balcony that's there now was a part of the original balconies in the 1792 foundation itself. And the chancel was, was also a part of the construction here. Um, and, and also, the Chimneys were constructed for wood stove. Up until that time, the, the church did not have any of the ability to heat itself. It was closed. Normally, the church was closed in November and was not open until after Easter in most cases. And the services were held in two homes. Um, and we had the wood stoves that stayed with us. For another 50 years, as far as that's concerned. Um, but that was the first time that we had heat in the church. But we had a, 
this way and uh, going through the depression itself. But then we had a reverend who came to us, a reverend Stevens, who was assigned to us in the diocese. And reverend Stevens was really a ball far as far as that's concerned. In 1925, he came to us. He came to us with a, in an old model key, and he, that model key stayed with him and with us for quite a while. Uh, his, he wasn't here very long before he had, had had a deep interest not only in the history of this church, but also the history of all the churches in Southern Maryland. I'm speaking of the Episcopal churches now. And he had a slogan that said, save the old churches. And believe me, he carried that all the way from here to Washington many, many, many times, that slogan. Let's save the churches. And he is the one that I give all credit to as far as being able to save this church and also the other churches in Charles County, Wayside, William and Mary, and the Orthodox Parish. Uh, <coughs> Robin Stevenson also had, was very concerned about the condition of the church law. I have been told that the churchyard was was, was, was overgrown with, with bushes, honeysuckle, and browse. If you wanted to go to a grave site, you had to cut your way to, had to make a path to it now. But he was able to get the industry to stop renovating and, and, and restoring the, the cemetery. And the, the vestry worked very hard on it, and if you look very closely on the wall, I think you see the listing of the, of the names of the vestry people who worked towards renovating the cemetery. They, uh, up until then, if you wanted to, to bury someone, you just came up and opened the grave and took care of it yourself, and there was no particular layout of the church or the church or nothing. So they have they moved the, the stones back in line with the, and, and also took care of the stones, upgraded the stones as far as anything that was laying down. It was in perfect condition. Um, and if the churchyard today is a credit to Reverend Stevenson and that particular best. We've done our best ever since then to make sure that it didn't happen again. Uh, also, in 1730, I'm sorry, 1932, we had the George Washington Bicentennial, and Robin Stevenson again took his slogan to work and, 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 and took advantage of the Bicentennial celebration. He was able to get the Colonial Danes to assist in the construction of the, of the brick wall that's in front of the church. Uh, they paid for all of the other work itself. But the brick work came from Puerto Vaca and from several of the houses that were, were taken down in Puerto Vaca. Uh, and we were able to get uh, someone to, to lay the work in this type of thing. But the Colonial Danes uh, provided any financial support we needed in support of the construction of that wall. Unfortunately, the wall has been, uh, been run into numerous 
team running on up here and, and in South Dallas today. The bell actually was made in London um, and, and it dates back at least um, 150 years. But and Reverend Stevenson also was very inter interested in saving the private cemeteries of the United And he was able to, he was very concerned about the condition of some of the some of the private cemeteries, and he was able to convince the families to let him move the stones up here and, or the, and, and part of the grave up here and at the church. He moved a total of six, six different stones, and two of those were the Harrison wives and the mother of, of the three Harrison men that I talked about. And we also had the two dense stones up there that was given to that, that we moved up here. And there are William Dent's children, and William Dent was the vestry person here in the late 1600s and the early 1700s. And he was the one who left the, the chalice and everything to the church. Um, and William Dent was, did a, a tremendous, he was a community person, and he worked very hard for this particular area. He served in the Senate and, and as a delegate to the General Assembly in Manhattan. Known as the as the Admiral of the Potomac River for a long time in this particular area. Uh, but Robin Stevenson left us in 1954. At that point, uh, we, we the vestry was faced with, with, with some major decisions. Well, Robin Stevenson had been the one who was. Um, Kind of guiding everything through with his model P. Um, but the, the investor made a, a, a decision that we would not, that well, anything that we did towards the church would be to restore it back to its original condition in any way possible. And that's uh, been the, the concept that we have followed since the 1950s. Um, one of the first things we did was to was to clean up and straighten up the, the pews. And, and as a part of Reverend Stevenson's work, by the way, uh, 